How's it going? And welcome to episode 42 of On The Wire, proud member of the Pitcher List Podcast Network. Follow the pod on the Twitter at On The Wire Pod. And if you're listening on a platform that allows ratings and reviews, please take a second to let us know what you think. I am Adam Howe. You can follow me on the Twitter at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. And once again, joined by Kevin Hastings, who should be followed on the Twitter himself at Hasting Kevin. Hey, Kevin, I noticed that your main event qualifier we talked about the last episode did finally fill up. So that's applause to that first MEQ of the year on the NFBC platform. You got to be a few rounds deep by now. We're recording this on Monday, the 3rd of January. This won't go out until the 9th. So by the time anybody's listening to this, there's a chance that your draft is over. How's the draft going so far? It's going well. It was really interesting. I put it out on Twitter and I think I even messaged you in our Discord that it filled up right as I was going to work. And it was going to be a busy night. It was January 30th on bartending. And I was like, oh man, I drew the... At that moment, I found out I was the 14th pick, which isn't ideal for setting up multiple rounds on auto (laughs) when they're that close together. But I did. I loaded up my queue and I got off work and I had uh, Acuna Jr. and Devers rostered. Pretty happy with that. I've steered away from Acuna Jr. so far, so it might be my only team with him and I'm happy to have one with him. And I uh, just hope hope it hope it works out, and hopefully he's healthy more than uh, I, I had anticipated in the past. And it looks like that might be the case, at least from some of the videos we've been seeing being posted. Yeah, you mentioned to me as well when you were talking about that off air. It, it's if you're gonna get him, even though he's more of an right now, he's more of an overall play type of pick. That's what we yeah. keep hearing. That's what we're thinking about. And in a main event qualifier. It's not an overall component, all. but there's all, it's winner take all, right? You basically have to be playing just like you're playing for an overall because there's no second place. You might as well, you know, come in 15th. Yep, exactly. So yeah, pretty happy with it so far. It's nice that you're, you're finally drafting a fab league as the calendar turns over. We are a fab podcast. So it, it's nice to see that we're getting into the swing of things. That's going to lead in why we were talking about it. And I think that... We're extremely excited to announce that we're going to be putting together our own Fab League, the On The Wire Listener League for the 2022 season. It's going to be ho- hosted over at NFBC. So thanks to Derek Buchert and the guys over there for getting that set up for us. The league will be a 12-teamer, so not 15 like your MEQ. It will be a Fab League. We are Fab Podcast. That is our focus. So you'll be able to hear all of our insights on that. It's a just simple $50 buy and just a, an online championship qualifier top three teams of the league will cash out. We'll track an overall champion as well, assuming if we fill more than one league. And each league will be filled with both listeners and former guests of the show, as well as Kevin and myself as well. So those listening, if you're interested in joining, we hope that you are. Shoot us a DM over at Twitter at On the Wire Pod, and we'll get you signed up with the uh, sign up link. It's, you can't find this link in the lobby of NFBC. You got to get the link from us. Uh, the first league will start drafting as soon as it fills up and it will have a two hour clock. So still slow draft. And I'm certain we'll be using this league to reference what we're talking about and 12 team fab options throughout the course of the season. So I'm really excited for that. We've already got a couple of, a couple of players locked in loaded and we're ready to go. So I'm hoping it fills up soon after this episode goes out and we'll get going yeah like noon on sunday i'm thinking that way <laughs> set your yeah set your kds quickly as soon as you sign up because it might flip over and we'll see when the second league goes so it's a when league fills draft and it'll be a lot of fun so check check that out send us a dm over at twitter and we'll get you signed up for that as soon as possible and preferably maybe shoot us a review on Apple Podcasts. Spotify is doing reviews now for podcasts. So that would be amazing to see that as well and show that you're really listening. We're not announcing this on Twitter yet. We're not announcing it anywhere else. We're just looking to see the listenership come in and jump in to start it off. I'm glad you mentioned Spotify to Adam because that that's where I listen. And I have noticed over the past week or so since they started doing that, I've been the first review for several of the podcasts I listen to. So if that is where you listen, please uh, take a moment to any of the podcasts you listen to and 
give them a quick five stars. Yeah. If you guys like it, what you're listening to, it's about somebody else is going to like it as well. And so do them a favor, do us a favor, do anybody else your favor, do our guest today's fa- a favor who hosts his own podcast. We'll get to in a second and just take two seconds at the very least five stars. You don't have to write anything nice, but if you want to go the extra mile and write something nice, <laughs> that's always appreciated. All right. So today, as I mentioned, we have with us one of, if not the strongest personalities in the industry today. And that of course is Michael Govier. Michael can be heard regularly on his own podcast. Hey, it's Enrico Palazzo Fantasy Baseball Podcast through the Roto Fanatic Podcast Network, as well as on the First Day Podcast, where he talks about everything related to mental health and addiction, and the Cinema 9 Pod, where he talks movies and musings. Listen to all of Michael's work. Links to all of Michael's work can be found in the episode description, along with links to his Twitter handle, at MJGovier which you should already be following for so many reasons. Today's episode is bound to be a little bit more conversational than perhaps we typically put out. And Michael is one of the best guests to have on, to have a conversation with. So thanks for joining us. And also welcome to the very first Pitcher List Podcast Network show, Michael, that you've uh, made an appearance on. They said it couldn't be done, Adam, but here I am. I'm finally on a Pitcher List Podcast of note. And it's a pleasure. I want to thank Nick Pollock. Thank you, Nick. It's a real pleasure to be here. I want to thank Kevin. Of course, I've met Kevin in real life at First Pitch Arizona this past fall. It's a real thing. And I strongly recommend going if you get a chance. There's one coming up in March. That's the Florida version. So if you want to meet people in the business and talk to them face-to-face and learn a ton about fantasy baseball, that's probably going to be cool, too. I hear the Arizona one's the best, but I'm sure the Florida one's cool. But I'm really glad to be here, guys. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, Michael, thank you so much for joining us. I, I love hearing that phrase, like, in real life, as if, like, <laughs> we have jumped into this this warped reality now of what is real and what is not real. As I'm not sure if Michael froze on purpose on his screen or if he was just posing or if it was <laughs> just the internet connection. Either way, that it worked out really nicely in that little segue. Michael, why don't you, can you tell our listeners uh, a little bit more about uh, the Palazzo podcast that you have been going on for a while now and uh, it's going strong? Yeah, you hear it. It's called the Palazzo podcast. Two L's, two Z's, I like to say, because it's easy to remember. And you might think, what the heck does that have to do with fantasy baseball? And really it doesn't. It's just for older folks or for comedy fans. The Naked Gun is a classic film, a total spoof movie, a satire, a, a parody of life itself with Leslie Nielsen, who was the master of that shtick. And there's a legendary extended final act, if you will, in that movie that is based around a professional Major League Baseball game, the Angels and the Mariners, back at the Big A, when it was the Big A back then. And Adam, you uh, lived in Oakland, so you're familiar with California baseball. And it was so cool to see it because it was funny, and it had all these celebrity broadcasters. Dick Vitale was in the mix at one point, kind of making fun of the fact that sometimes there's way too many broadcasters in one sitting for a game, like Monday Night Football, for example, back in the day. And that's there's this guy who stands up and says, hey, that's Enrico Palazzo. And it's a famous line and a quote. And I decided to say, hey, we love this movie. We love it. We love L.A. That's also in that scene. A lot of fun by Randy Newman. Classic. Love Randy Newman. So we figured, let's call our show. Hey, it's Enrico Palazzo, fantasy baseball, which is definitely drawn out and unnecessary. But, uh... The moniker of Palazzo Pod is really taken off, and it actually it's alliteration too. We all love alliteration, so I think these it's just the Palazzo Pod. But officially, if you go into Spotify and try to rate us, I think you have to type in, "Hey, it's Enrico Palazzo Fantasy Baseball Podcast." Yeah, and you make it in such a way where that moniker can come up naturally, like it just you just have adopted that Palazzo Podcast or Palazzo Pod yeah. moniker. It works out really well, and you can keep the long name, and that's great. It gives you more character, and because <laughs> that is one thing you're probably striving to really grasp onto is just more character for for your pod. <laughs> more, yes, we need much more. But that's actually how you can follow us. The main home base is usually Twitter, Palazzo Podcast. That's the handle. Two L's, two Z's. Very easy, and you know, we're Roto Fanatic is a website that I run with Matt Williams and Carmen Arano, Paul Mamino, some other guys, Crosby Spencer. They are great people and it's a free fantasy baseball site too. So we're very small. We're a tiny operation, but we've been around for a couple of years and it's interesting to try to do your own thing, have your own website. I've never done that until I, I jumped into this thing almost two years ago now. So check out runfanatic.com. Check it out. Learn 
The Data Monster is cool. And of course, I wanted to mention the FTN Fantasy Five Tool Draft Guide. This thing is loaded with people that know what they're talking about. And forget if forget the fact that I wrote an article in it. I wrote a head-to-head piece, which is useful. And head-to-head always gets poo-pooed a lot, especially in this realm, the fantasy analyst realm of baseball. There's a lot of head-to-head haters out there. I grew up on head-to-head on Yahoo. That's where I first learned all about fantasy baseball. So I stand up for it. I wrote a piece in it. But beyond that, there's people like Jenny Butler, a a tremendous high-stakes player who write about roster construction, which is really good in the focus that this show would centralize. So I really want to recommend it. Go to ftnfantasy.com. Check it out. It's $19.99 if you sign up, and it's a PDF, so you can have it anywhere in the world at any time. You can download it, and it's like 100-plus pages of fantasy baseball goodness. The baseball forecaster is legendary, but we're just trying to give you another supplement to add to your overall portfolio of baseball prep for 2022. And honestly, you can't have too much of that going in. Oh, we're finally going through our first full season of baseball in over two years going into the, as you were reminding us on Twitter every day, when the lockout was going to start or when the CBA was going to (laughs) expire, which I both loved and hated that I saw that in my feed every single day. (laughs) I know how you feel. (laughs) Who knows what's gonna what's gonna happen? And we try to stay on the side of positive positive thinking. No news is good news type of situation. Being prepared will you know go th- that much further for you when you finally start doing your drafts. For those who haven't started doing our drafts, and I know, my God, we talked about it. you did a draft back in October, if I'm not mistaken. I'm assuming yeah. you did that over at First Pitch um, in Arizona. If I'm if, oh. correct me if I'm wrong. Actually, so I've done two drafts. That's okay. the other one. I started a draft that's not finished. That was begun at first pitch. That's correct, Adam. And that was a, gosh, a best ball, I believe. There was okay. a best ball. There was also a DC draft going on in the other room with a lot more of the heavy hitters like Paul Spore and Justin Mason and Mike Curlin and people like that. And it was me and Jenny Butler and Shelly Veristrate and some other stragglers, just regular folks who were in the best ball draft. And I think we got through 23 rounds. Everybody agreed we had to stop there and wait until mid-January where we're going to finish by email. But that was the draft I did at first pitch. But I also did a full-on DC draft in October that I completed. Nice, nice. Yeah, I've heard like that that kind of format. I don't know if the DC did that in first pitch. I remember hearing Paul Sport talk about Sleeper the Bus like two years ago. We did that draft and they planned on stopping it, I think, in round like 15 or something like that. And so he, I thought it was really smart. I don't know how it worked out for him, but he picked his KDS so that he would have the first pick when they re when they brought back the draft. So in January yeah. or February. So you did, you know, the first half of your draft in October, and then you start back up in January, February when players have signed more what's going on. So it's like almost having the new one, one at that point of the draft. I thought that was clever. I know Kevin, you did your auction over in first pitch, Arizona. So lots of really cool drafts happening all the way in October. And we've talked about plenty of those. Kevin and I are finishing up our DC right now, the first draft that we've drafted together. And I haven't told you, I haven't told you this already, Kevin, but you've definitely sniped me more than once and we're like four picks apart and it's really hard to (laughs) snipe in the 41st round, but somehow it continues to happen in the (laughs) drafts. Yeah. That, well, it's pretty typical. I think for when a couple of guys talk so much and so often, and even this time of year when we're only doing it every other week, maybe a couple of uh, messages back and forth in between episodes, but yeah, it's just, it's unavoidable that uh, even late we're going to be on some of the same players. Yeah. And then, like I said, it's a DC and Michael, you're going to be doing your P- Palazzo pod listener league as well. And that is a DC format. I can remember I, I did that last year as well. I did that in then Zach Waxman's uh, draft champions listener league as well. Oh yeah. I, I cashed in one and not in the other. I can't remember which one it was, but I is, was yours a uh, 12 or 15 team league setup? It was a 15-team yep. DC, so do or die, 50 players, 50 rounds, that's it. And a lot of people, several first-timers. So it was cool to get these people who had, we're talking seasoned veteran players that I know, but they've just never played on NFBC.com or been involved in these draft and holds, which is foreign to me until two years ago. I never really heard of it either. So it was a 
weird experience to try to express to my friend, my good friend, Joel, I've known him since, gosh, we used to listen to Stone Temple Pilots core in the basement. I remember we were begging for a snow day in 1992 in the basement, 93. And he was always a good dude, but I got him to play in this draft and hold. And he's, what is going on? I don't get this. Like I'm supposed to draft these players now and hope it works out later. Like, how do you develop a pitching? How do you develop a pitching rotation? Uh, should I have 10 pitchers? Should I have 12, 15? A lot of questions for newcomers. So I think there's a lot of confusion and uncertainty when it comes to drafting holds for the general fantasy baseball public. Yeah, I agree. I did my first, I don't know my first ever, but I did my first few 50 rounders on the NFBC last season. And it it was a wake up call for sure. Like the strategy (laughs) is completely different. It's fairly different. There are a lot more things to take into account and that you really can't be thinking about um, or shouldn't be thinking about in a, you know, fab league where you can drop guys, pick up guys and make changes throughout the course of the season. So you can't do that in in these drafts. So you're stuck with what you got. Yeah. I miss that. I miss that a lot. I think I'm a fab guy. I'm not quite sure yet, but Early returns of my experience of doing more types of formats. I've done everything now, best ball, DCs, whatever. I've done them all, points, leagues, head-to-heads. I think I'm a fab guy. I think I rely on the fact that I can make moves during the season and strike when the iron is hot. Is that what they say? Strike when the I iron that's is hot. right. Yeah, sure. Yeah. The, the cooking gets warm. I, I don't know. Something like that. All I know is that I was also jealous of Kevin at first pitch because he was in that auction draft. I popped in on that auction. It was a live, I mean, real-time salary cap draft and i was like whoa people are bidding and saying things in real time and they're going back and forth and this thing was so intense and fast paced i was bored for it i'm like why did i choose the best ball draft what a regret for me so i will definitely be doing that type of draft if i get the chance especially in person it's a huge difference as compared to just sitting in your chair online oh yeah we had jeff erickson was the auctioneer he kept that thing moving He did. (laughs) Impressive, Jeff. Kudos to him. Jeff has created uh, an aura around himself, and people just know that. If Jeff's going to be your uh, auctioneer, your draft is going to move along. I didn't know that until I saw him (laughs) in action. But holy, Jeff Erickson, I was very impressed by you. Not that I wasn't already impressed, Jeff, because I know you're listening to this. You listen to every episode on The Wire. But I want to make it clear as well that when we tried to change it, because I was thinking for the Plaza Invitational this year, let's try a different format. Maybe try something different every year just to see how the public likes it or how everyone does. And everybody overwhelmingly in a poll that I posted at Palazzo Podcast on Twitter, 2 else 2 zs everybody said, we want to do a DC again. We don't want to do best ball. We don't want to do a fab, which I was really hoping for a fab league this year. So I was disappointed on the results, but it looks like we'll do another draft and hold. Yeah, I think, I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think the consensus is like, if I'm going to join a new league, I don't want it to take up a lot of my time. I've got my home league. I've got this and that, what have you. Maybe that higher end players are doing a main event or they're doing their you know, multiple OCs. So they already have a bunch of fab leagues. And fab can be tedious when you have a lot of leagues, especially if you have a lot of leagues on a lot of different platforms. So if you've got a fab league on Fantrax and on, for whatever reason, you have a fab league on Yahoo, which are rare, and you're your aunt new as well, and CBS and what have you, it can really add up your time, especially on Sundays, or especially if your fab runs on Saturdays on one platform and Sundays on the NFPC or what have you. So I get it. I'm hoping that with our with ours, we chose to go fab. Obviously, we're a fab podcast. And we're hoping we can really dive it toward people. If you're planning on doing an online championship qualifier, which is exactly the same format, 12 teams, 50 bucks, do ours, do our league instead. And you win the same amount of money. You can use it toward an OC or you can do whatever you want with it because it's not a coupon. It's actual money. <laughs> Got to win it first, I guess. All right. Today, we are going to talk about some common strategies. There's going to be more of an evergreen episode with some nuances with the current players and current draft ADP mixed in. But I think it'll go a long way throughout the course of draft season as it, as we're approaching it. We're going to talk about some common strategies that are used in fantasy baseball across different formats. Some are a bit format specific, but most can be used in various situations. Along with a brief synopsis of strategy, I'm going to ask you guys for your personal take on the viability of each. And then we'll also talk about a couple key players that you think would be essential to target and to avoid for each scenario. 
especially as current ADP is is being formatted. And I'm going to use NF, you can use NFBC ADP. And something I want to I saw on Twitter. I think John Fish said it over on Twitter, and I'm going to echo it as well. It's really important when you get when anybody is looking at ADP, what kind of ADP you're looking at. I think we talked about this in our very first episode, Kevin, how important it is to know the difference between the ADP of best ball leagues versus draft and hold leagues versus fab leagues for that matter. 12 teams, 15 teamers, they all have different nuances. And so I see this a lot and I'm not singling out any one person, but I see this a lot on Twitter. It's like when they just say, this guy's going at NFBC ADP of 225. One ADP just by saying that means nothing because you should really be looking at uh, date ranges at the very least. But like relievers, and we talked about this in previous episodes, but r- really important to know what kind of drafts that you are pulling your ADP from. And NFBC is really good about you can filter what kind of drafts you're looking at your ADP from. So make sure you're doing that. That's just free advice. Not that any of our advice costs money, but that piece is extra free. So we're going to get into some of those strategies as well, but we're going to come right back after this quick word. Hey, Alex Fast here, and thanks for listening to this podcast on the Pitcher List Podcast Network. If you're a fan, consider supporting all of us by getting a PL Plus subscription, where you're going to get an ad-free website and get access to our Discord, where you can talk to all of our podcast hosts and staff. Plus, you can hang out with our incredible Pitcher List community. It's basically a baseball sanctuary year-round for as low as $8 a month. You can sign up at pitcherlist.com backslash plus, and you're going to get your first month free with promo code podcast. Also, don't forget to check out everything else we do as well from YouTube videos, live streams, newsletters, off-season articles, TikToks, breakdowns, over 15 baseball podcasts on our network. We can't stop talking about baseball even during the off-season. So sign up for PL Plus today at pitcherlist.com backslash plus and use promo code podcast to get your first month free. All right. Thanks for listening. Let's get back to the show. All right, guys, let's get right into it. I wanted to get that um, out of the way so we could not be interrupted as we discuss some of the more well-known or the ones you've heard about strategies, and especially when it comes to drafting. So I'm going to go back and forth to you guys. Love to hear you guys just talk amongst yourselves or ourselves about these strategies and what you feel about them. If this is a strategy that you've used in the past, you plan on trying to use in a lot of these strategies, you don't have to be tied to. You can just try them out, especially if you do a lot of different drafts. You can try them out and see if they work for you in a certain situation and the room may dictate it does or doesn't. But in general, let's talk about these. So first and foremost, I'm going to start with the quote unquote pocket aces theory or theorem. And that is the idea of loading up on two top starting pitchers at the top of your draft, addressing hitting later and really focusing on the top of your rotation versus what I just call the heavy hitters uh, scenario where you're really focusing, especially on the first two, if not the first three or four rounds, going hitter only and then trying to find the diamonds in the rough in your for your rotation later on in, in the draft. Kevin, do you have a preference? If in, And you can't take the middle road on this one. Do you have a preference on if gun to your head, you've got to pick, you've got to take a strategy and you've got to stick with it. Which one are you looking at doing in a regular basis? And then is this season any different? There are so many questions right there. Yes, (laughs) Uh, absolutely. I prefer going hitters early. However, this is really interesting to me. And the fact that you said that you can't go middle road here, there's a huge middle road between pocket aces and not taking a pitcher to the sixth round, the the way you had it explained in in our notes. I don't think, unless I'm forgetting something, I don't think I've taken a starting pitcher prior to the third round yet this season. But I haven't had two starting pitchers until at least the sixth round. So I am middle road. To answer your question, prefer if I had to pick one or the other, I'm going hitters early. I think this is something new. The pocket aces terminology made popular by our friend Toby Fat Flip Crazy. I think actually Ryan Bloomfield came up with the term, but it was for Toby, I believe. And prior to a few years ago, 
pretty much industry wide pitchers weren't taken in the first round at all almost never the once in a while when it came up when Kershaw was so dominant prior to that when Pedro Martinez was so dominant it seemed like those seasons were the seasons they didn't perform and and there was uh, all kinds of opinions that that mostly agreed that pitchers were just too injury prone was I the main reason we didn't like that strategy it was more likely your first round player would get hurt if you did that now over the last few years especially in, in some of the higher stakes nfbc leagues that script is totally flipped uh, pitchers go early sometimes you get pocket aces first and second round I've seen some drafts this year where the thir- first three picks for a team were starting pitchers, and it just seems more viable. Another portion of that question you asked is, does it change year to year? You were asking about this year in particular. It has for me. I started to buy in to the pocket aces strategy a little bit last season, maybe not first two rounds, but first and third at times. And that's just not the way things have played out for me this season. There's too many guys I like that are, would have been considered pocket aces last season. This year, they're not. I've picked later in most of the drafts I've been in. And so I've been waiting till that late third round early in draft season we're still early in draft season in october (laughs) i I was able to get aaron nola there that's already not happening any longer towards the end of the third round he's gone but i'm grabbing another guy similar that was considered an ace last year had a down year luis castillo so it's shifted i think i'm still getting aces but i'm not taking them in the first two rounds the first two rounds of 15 teamers, so draft champions since December 1st, looking at ADP there on NFBC, 43% of the players taken in the first two rounds are starting pitchers. Hendricks doesn't go into the third as far as ADP is concerned. And in 12 teamers, so in the NFBC 50s, the other draft and hold format that NFBC puts out with only 12 teamers, 33%, that's eight out of the t- first t- 24 picks have been searched. So there there are definitely players out there in early drafters that are going pocket aces here. And there's certain players that you probably want to focus on if you're going to go that strategy. Michael, do you... If we change the format here, do you have a, a different opinion? So I'm going to I'm gonna switch this over to a head-to-head as you wrote a whole article about head-to-head strategy. Mm. Does the idea of going pocket aces or going pitcher heavy early change at all in that format, in your opinion? Or do you set, do you set your same kind of procedures regardless of what format? This is complicated to me, Adam, because... Is there fab? And if so, are there streamers? Is there an allotment of transactions per week available? And had to me, at least in my experience, it's always been the case that you have the option to stream two start pitchers. And it's crucial. It's actually very important for supplementing your team and your roster construction. So if you go back to the draft and you say, hey, I'm doing pocket aces, you don't need to do that when you have that type of scenario. So if it's that specific and you're in that type of head-to-head league where you have the ability to stream starters every week, there's no way. I have no interest. I'm definitely pro the best players, the best hitters, the guys that can fill at least four categories. If we're talking like a five-by-five standard category, head-to-head, 10-category total, I want those hitters that can drive in runs, hit homers, hit for average, maybe not get steals, but four out of five ain't bad. And always remember in head-to-head, you don't want to win every category. Just win enough to win every week. If you win seven to three, Every week, you can win a championship that way because that's winning every week. It's that simple. (laughs) So I don't think I've ever been big. In fact, in head-to-head, I'm always not excited. I'm not passionate about grabbing the big-time starting pitchers in the beginning. I always look for the guys around the late 90s into the first 100, 110, 120 guys. You know, guys like Sandy Alcantara last year were big targets of mine, people that I wanted to roster because I knew – that he had the innings capability, he would pitch a lot, and that he would grow and take another step. I didn't know if he would be that amazing, although I did say it was a possible dark horse Cy Young candidate last year. I did, I wrote that 
on rotofanatic.com for the record. So I'm going to give myself a little credit there. But that's just an example of a guy that I could wait on later. And if we're in head-to-head, I think I'm avoiding the two elite diamond stud ace pitchers strategy altogether. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you guys. I, I'm not typically a pocket aces type of guy, regardless of format, to be honest. Um, I do mm. like to get one, especially going into this year. Strikeouts seem to be very similar to stolen bases. They're gonna. It seems like they're really hard to get come by, and and I'm gonna want to make sure I get that base. And Nick Pollock talks about this all the time. He talked about this throughout talking about our mock drafts that we did a pitcher list early on in October. It's good to have that, especially in a Fab League, whether it's head to head or roto. If you have that base of your rotation, your top four guys you can rely on and 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 not have to worry about dropping or even better, not quote have to worry about injuries, which is doesn't exist. I get that. That kind of leads me to if you are gonna go pocket aces, Kevin, like of the the top thirteen starters that are going off the board, are there two guys or two or four two or three or four guys that you would either be completely avoiding? In order to hit that strategy, so those who are like dead set on I have, I'm going pocket aces. Who are the ones that they should probably be avoiding for reliability reasons, or innings reasons, or just opportunity reason? If you're going to have that base, you better be the best base. For me, most of them, and that's why I haven't done it yet. I I, I go into drafts being pretty open about what I am going to do. Yeah, I, I have a plan. What I'd like to happen. It never happens for me, (laughs) for me, the one guy that hasn't made it to me yet. Cause I'm this year, I'm not doing this. If I'm drafting early in the first round, I'm just not, but the, the times that I have picked late in the first round, which has been most of my drafts, I've been picking the, the 10 spot or later in most drafts I've done a couple of times. Garrett Cole almost made it to me. If he would make it to me towards the end of the first round, I I was planning on snagging him and then possibly taking someone on the way back or one of the same guys that I have already been taking in the third and and consider that my pocket aces first and third round. I love Corbin Burns. It, it, It hasn't been very long. He's been doing it right. The age with Max Scherzer, the, the Zach Wheeler, Zach Wheeler has been around a long time and now all of a sudden we're going to take him at the end of the first round or early in the second just doesn't feel right to me. So to answer your question, it's most of these guys I'm avoiding if Garrett Cole would make it to me or if I would change my tune and, and decide to do that if I'm picking a little earlier in the first round where I can get Garrett Cole. I have my NFBC 15 team ADP filtered to the last two and a half weeks right now there's only been eight drafts the latest Garrett Cole has went is with the ninth pick that's his max pick over that time frame but his min is six so if I would change my tune and I'm picking somewhere in the seven eight nine range and and grab him I don't think I'm grabbing these other top 10 ADP guys but I could grab one of the guys that I have been taking in the third someone like I mentioned Aaron Nola and Luis Castillo, even a little later, Logan Webb in that range. And I'm still getting two or three top-notch hitters prior to grabbing that second pitcher. All right, if we're not going pocket aces, Michael, if you are going more hitter-friendly, especially in the first two, if not f- first four rounds, what kind of players, are, do you have a certain kind of player that you really have to get, or are, like you said earlier, or is it more of, the best player available regardless of position regardless of what kind of stat categories or are you going after those statistical anomalies that are going to go away quickly sometimes things don't go away quickly adam i don't know about your experience in life but i've had a few things that didn't go away very fast that's just how it is but the ones that always go quickly are those guys that can hit for average and steals would probably be the other one. But sometimes people aggressively jump on steals. And I think you can be a little more patient. You don't have to take a guy just because he steals bases at a high clip, like a Alberto Mondesi, for example. So inconsistent. You don't want to take a risk on a guy like that. I know you're not taking him in the first round. That's clearly not what I'm saying. He's just an example of a guy who steals a lot of bags, but comes with a lot of baggage. Isn't that funny? He steals bags, got baggage. Hmm. I see what he did there. 
Yeah. I actually never done that before. I just stumbled upon that on the show here. But also to Kevin's point, if Garrett Cole makes it to like the 10th pick, I'm going to take Garrett Cole. I'm pretty confident. I'll look at the landscape again, but that would be something that would be unique. There are caveats and weird things happen in your drafts, so be prepared for that. But the guys I like are the guys who can hit for average, and I share this sentiment. It was reinforced by a good friend of mine, Dave McDonald, as part of the Rotosaurus, less than Dave on Twitter. He's a great follow, and he says the guys that are always the most difficult to snag and secure, and the one that dries up in terms of scarcity the most quickly is batting average guys. And if you're playing in, Batting average league, standard 5 by 5 roto, but you're going to need those types of players. Those are the players that power's everywhere, right? These days, power is a joke for the most part, although maybe that's been pulled back a little bit because MLB's always screwing with the baseball. We never know, know what, what base- you're getting. No. <laughs> yeah, we never know. Kevin, we have no idea what baseball is out there. In fact, I don't want to spend the whole show on it, but it's such a big deal, such a variable. They're so very important. That shouldn't be a variable at all. That's why it's such a bummer for me, too. So if we put that aside, it seems like maybe the power got a little too elite around 2019. It scaled back a tad, but then it picked up in the second half last year when you start to look at the numbers. It's so bizarre. So I still think power is readily available. Batting average is key. Guys like uh, Mookie Betts used to be solid for batting average. He wasn't an elite batting average guy, but that's the kind of guy where he does everything so well. It's almost the example of an ideal player. Hits for solid average and does everything, including steals. At least he used to. So that's the kind of guy I would like to have in my team. A Trey Turner is another one, but everyone's going to draft Trey Turner. That's a no-brainer. Ozzie Albies is another kind of guy that I think he has more batting average room to grow. And if he can creep up closer to 300, then that's the kind of guy I would love to have in my team. Yeah, I think a guy like Brian Reynolds, who's not going to go in the first two or three rounds, is definitely a target of mine. He was in this past DC that we're in. Yes, yes. That's an ideal guy right there. Like You want to find the Brian Reynolds of last year where he was going down in there because that was like one of the last (laughs) gems in the draft for good batting average floor that you could find last year. Yeah, the problem is like you you wait too long. Like You mentioned that it does dry up there are some batting average guys out there in the late rounds but that's they're all empty they're all not all but they're pretty empty adam frazier louis Louis, adam frazier we'll see he might be at the top of the seattle lineup um going this year he might provide you some runs if he's in there on a regular basis but yeah louis arias maybe nicky lopez if he stops running empty batting average there good opp guy though strange yeah well it's very rare, I think, that we find leagues that do adding batting average and OBP in the same league. But I guess that'd be interesting. That would, that would really switch up ADP for sure. It's complicated. Very complicated if that happens. I don't want to be in that league. No. <laughs> I had enough to worry about. But we talked about some position scarcity and statistical scarcity. So I want to ask, talk to you guys about how you guys are addressing those concerns, whether or not you are worried about it at all throughout the course of the draft. So there is the strategy of hitting up, looking for those tiers, looking for the the tiers of when they drop off at third base. We talked about it in a couple of episodes ago. Talk about something I want to touch on is shortstop actually has some pretty big tiers and, and everybody says it's super deep, but there are obvious tiers that you can jump off of. So Kevin, are you addressing the concerns of talent depth in your drafts early on in your draft rather than taking the risk of missing out on those top tier talents at certain positions or are again is it more of a best case scenario and you'll figure out where you can get to the next tier or the bottom of the next tier later on in the draft yeah i think the most obvious situation here especially in the draft it holds early is the the save scarcity which means we have a scarcity of closers they go hand in hand there when we don't have fab and we're drafting these right now and we have a handful of closers we know we can count on those guys have been driven up and Liam Hendricks has been taken in the second round and in most drafts I've done and and Josh Hader in the third and then the rest of the guys start running off of the board in the fourth it's really crazy in the fab league I'm doing Hendricks still went pretty early Hader still went fairly early and then there's a long log weight it, it's not as necessary to make sure you have those guys on your roster now we can pick guys up later as far as other i i think 
catcher comes to mind in this situation as well. We Catcher's been a scarce position for years. There's been one or two guys each year. And I'll bring up Bat Flip Crazy again. He's been a, 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 a big proponent of taking JT Real Muto early. Uh, this year, that guy is Salvador Perez and Real Muto's uh, a couple rounds later. And it, it's the, the thing that's really interesting to me about the catcher position is, is we talk so much or we have been so many people have been this off season and gradually over the past couple of years about getting at bats and at the catching position, there's only a handful of guys that are going to get those at bats. And then even if they do, are they at bats you even want? Some of these guys that are projected to get close to 400 plate appearances are still only projected for 40 runs and RBIs with a 220 batting average. Do you want those guys in your lineup anyway? Are they helping? Or what I've discovered is at, at this case, when we're starting to get into this range where so many of the players that are going to be in our startings lineups aren't very good. <laughs> Does the, <laughs> just looking at bats then isn't enough. Take a guy like Mike Zanino. Uh, he can hit over 30 home runs. He's going to have a horrible batting average, but he hits those 30 home runs and 300 at bats. That's a good thing. The less at bats, the better. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's really intriguing concept here. Early in draft season, I was worried about third base. It seemed like the elite guys dropped off really early. I've discovered over these past couple of months that ah, there's some guys available a little later that that I'm a little, little happier with. You brought it up, shortstop. As good as it is and with the elite players at the top and as deep as it is, you're absolutely right. There's some big cliffs along the way. I, I've gotten stuck in two, at least two drafts so far this year, including the one we're in. Even though I reached and grabbed Bobby Witt Jr. in the fifth round, I'm like, cool, not worried about shortstop. And the thing is that all the other shortstops, they go in bunches. So like your Seager and your Correa's, they, that group, even Willie Adamas is creeping up into that group. Like they're all gone. So it's, yeah, there are a lot of them, but they go just like closers. It's, if you miss the run, you miss the cliff. So just, I'm going to throw that out there. Shortstop is something I'm going to be avidly concerned about in most of my drafts. And I will have no problem filling my middle infield position on NFBC drafts with a shortstop, with a top tier shortstop, especially in a draft and hole format, or that way I have that backup that I can fill in at the position and not feel like I, I lost a lot at the position if somebody goes down. Or in my current situation, if Bobby Witt doesn't actually make the opening day roster and I'm stuck now with Elvis Andrews as my starting shortstop, which will be the case on opening day, unfortunately. Hopefully it's not for very long, if any time at all. Yeah, but- the way to go for your middle infielder, if you can, because then you have your backup shortstop. You may not draft a certain player to be a second baseman, but when I counted a couple of weeks ago, like 62 players of the top 360 players drafted are eligible at second base. So it may not be ideal, but you probably have someone on your roster you can slide in there. Yeah, there's a lot more players that are eligible, like you said, that you might not have planned on putting there, but you could fill in. So that's a good call out there. Michael, do you have a preference when it comes to positional scarcity? Now, some, we talked a little bit already about statistical scarcity. I understand your points on that. But p- for positional scarcity, are you focused on that, especially in the top half of your drafts? Yeah, positional scarcity is something that we should take note of and be aware of. I've already heard the... Yeah. Narrative. It feels like the word narrative just took over the world five, seven years ago. I don't know why. I, when I was a kid or even when I was 20 years old, we didn't say narrative all the time. We said narrative story. Was somebody or, reading a story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But darn it all. They got it in my head. They put it in all of our heads. And narrative is just how we describe the general trends that go around. You can call them gossip. You can call them rumors. You can call them word around the campfire. If you're a big Pulp Fiction fan, I'll say this. The people in the fantasy baseball realm, which I like to call it the realm, are saying that uh, third base is scarce. I'm hearing a lot of fears about third base. Oh boy, you better get yourself a third baseman. In fact, a guy I respect a lot, Ryan Venancio, who's an excellent fantasy baseball mind, 
he uh, was saying, I think on this podcast a couple of weeks ago, I listened to over the break, you better get yourself, you know, one of the studs there. And if you don't get them early, then you're in big trouble at third base. So these types of narratives start to take <laughs> off. And you could also use them to your advantage because if you see contradictions in what the general public is believing, then that is where you can strike. So positional scarcity can sometimes work out in your favor. I thought last year there was a lot of opportunity at second base. And everybody was saying last year, second base is a nightmare. No, no. And when Marcus Simeon became second base eligible, that was a godsend. People loved that. And that boosted second base. And also I thought a guy like Nick Solak would be a lot better. That So I was wrong, I guess, about that one. So maybe that was a little bit more scarce. And this is where you fall into the situation of guys that you believe in, that you've done your homework on, not coming through for you. If you're wrong about position, it can really burn you. So if you're going to take a risk as a starter later in the draft on a guy in a scarce position, you better be really sure. Because if you're stuck with a hole there in a position that does have a lack of depth, you're in real trouble. Yeah, I think third base is definitely was a concern of mine going in. I, I focused on it in the early parts of my early drafts. I got Machado in this one. I've got Endeavors in a, in a different one. I drafted Jose Ramirez as the number two overall in one of my DCs. It was a focus of mine because it wasn't something I wanted to have to worry about later. But when you, I realized that when you do that, all you're doing is you're pushing your worries into somewhere else. <laughs> like in this draft, now I'm worried about my shortstop death. And so you figure out that you're always going to have something. And, and I think some of the best advice I've heard a lot this offseason, and I've heard in the past as well, is, is try to move backwards in your draft. Go back, go deep into your draft. Hey, this is the kind of target I would want to get here. He could fill this position. So I don't have to, I don't necessarily have to worry about it at the top round, in my top round. So work your way backwards in your drafts. And then you can really figure out what probably will be available. But you never know. It's like the ADP right now is all over the place. And really it's being dictated by the 10 or 15 guys that are drafting in every single draft out there. And so your value could be completely different. And I guess make sure you're trusting your own value over ADP. You know, Kevin taught me that just in this draft as I was planning on grabbing Glaber Torres in the 10th round or something like that. And you jumped him up to the seventh or eighth round, Kevin. And that, that kind of threw a monkey wrench into my whole plan of as I was trying to work backwards in that draft. So you, you don't know what's going to go on. And so to know what your other options are, make sure you have contingencies plans throughout the course of the draft. <laughs> yeah. And I'll say one more thing about that too. In the, I'm not just dropping this in here. This is good stuff for you. In the FTN 5 Tool Fantasy Draft Guide, available at ftnfantasy.com, Jenny Butler makes a great point about if you're using a standings points gain where you're trying to hit a certain number, you don't even care about the players, you just want to hit a certain statistical number. When you're identifying the positions, you have to make sure that you haven't sacrificed yourself, like Adam said, in another spot, but you also have to be prepared to make sure that you're not spoiling the total that you're trying to get to by reaching on guys at positions you're worried about. That's one of the key aspects there. You have to break down his position and then you have to find out where the pockets of value are. That's key. And Jenny makes a really, she breaks it down to detail in that article about these pockets of value in these positions. They do exist. It just takes more time and energy to make sure that you know who you're targeting, and who the four people beyond who you're targeting are just in case you get sniped like Adam, you were by Kevin and vice versa in the draft you're doing. It's very important to have those backups ready, locked, and organized. It is. Yeah, it's a good call to standing gains point as we talked about with Jeff and, and Tanner last on our last episode. So make sure you check out the process for more information there and, and go over to smartfantasybaseball.com. That's Tanner's website for more information on standing gains points. If you're not familiar with that at the moment, though, I have a feeling that the majority, if not all of our listeners, at least are somewhat familiar with the term by now. All right. It's getting popular. It is getting popular. All right, let's talk about, or so we talked about focusing on certain categories or positions. Let's talk about the strategy of not focusing on certain categories. And that is, of course, punting categories. You hear a lot about this in standalone leagues, in Roto. And I'm going to ask you guys more, Michael, so I'm going to start with you because 
I would like to know your take on this in a roto league versus a head to head league, which one is more viable. And I have a feeling we all know the answer, but I want to hear it out of, out of your mouth. How viable is it? If you're going to do it, which categories are you punting and why? Well, Adam, it does seem like it's an obvious choice here. Head to head. It look, you could punt cats and still win a week, but you know, I think roto punting categories is also very important. So I wouldn't dismiss it entirely. I really wouldn't. And those of you out there listening, if you're not playing in an overall, that's, I think, an important caveat we should add here, right? Because if there's an overall, you want to try to win the whole thing, and that's a completely different structure for your strategy. But if there's no overall involved, if it's a standalone league, like you say, then you're just locked in on winning that league. And you can easily punt in Roto and head-to-head. People punt saves rather easily instead of getting caught up in the closer chaos. And, you know, Kevin, you were talking about the draft earlier and the Liam Hendricks going to round two. And this is one of the biggest aspects of fear for me about drafting right now, especially with the lockout going on. We have more moves that have to happen. And then we have to have a spring training where the roster starts to gel and come together. There's so many uncertain areas related to closers and who's going to get the saves and who's not. That is one of my biggest fears right now. I'm like, how can you draft? How can you? People are drafting Giovanni Gallegos right now with relative certainty that he's the closer and they're doing it at a very high ADP. That makes me very uncomfortable. And that is a prime situation, an ideal recipe, in my view, for punting saves in both Roto and head-to-head. In head-to-head, you can look at a weekly matchup, your upcoming opponent, and say, okay, they're strong in the RBIs and the hitting categories. They're a little weak in whip and ERA. You could also say, all right, I am going to st- steal those pitching categories and focus on them by doing whatever needs to be done, whether it's picking players up or starting the guys you think that will be to your best advantage in those cats. And at the same time, you could be sacrificing, I don't know, uh, strikeouts or possibly wins or something like that. And week to week, head to head leagues like that, you can do that. And Roto head to head, I think have more in common than we think. It's just that Roto is a full season's worth. And if you dismiss saves entirely or you dismiss steals get weird, they get complicated. I think you could dismiss steals and still win in a league, a standalone league in Roto. I really do. Yeah, I would say that steals definitely only because the difference between each standing point in steals is so much smaller than other categories. Typically, the difference between the total stolen bases at the top and the bottom is going to be a lot closer than home runs or definitely RBIs uh, and runs. I see um, you're saying. So yeah. you, if you chose to if you saw an opportunity mid-season to jump up a, a point or two and like really fab out on speedsters and fill that gap you could you have that option i think you don't have that option as much in the power department it's definitely not in, in batting average because it fluctuates so you can go up or down gavin do you have a do you, do you agree or disagree in in that sentiment oh i agree a hundred percent and and the biggest point i'd like to make when punting embrace the punt go all out (laughs) it's yeah don't they're not doing you any good and you're hurting yourself in the other categories by trying to at least dabble in so earlier today i removed stolen bases from my auction calculator here are guys that dropped out they dropped out of the top 10 trey turner is no longer a top 10 pick according to the auction calculator Jose Ramirez is no longer top 10. Bo Bichette's no longer top 10, right? These guys completely drop out. Who, who moves up? Obviously, Vlad Guerrero and, and Juan Soto, right? But Freddie Freeman's top five now. Devers moves up to six. Jordan Alvarez, top 10 player if we take out stolen bases. Embrace it. You're missing out on better batting averages, as Michael brought up. And the extreme power that you're going for, if you still dabble in, oh, Jose Ramirez is still going to hit 30 home runs. Yeah, but he's not going to hit 40. And he's not going to do it with the batting average. That not going to do it with the 280, might. yeah. <laughs> so embrace the punt if you're going to punt. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, if you are going to punt, you're gar- you're guaranteeing yourself just the one or two points in that category. You need the 12 or 15 points in at least – two out of the other four categories on the offensive side. I venture to guess also I looked at 
that just I, i'm sorry to interrupt the other thing i looked at is i thought format number of teams and number of categories might matter it, it doesn't it's minuscule it's small percentages you go from needing 80th percentile to finish with the same number of points to 88th percentile in every other category regardless of league size or number of categories you have to go all out you have to you're going from finishing third or fourth to first or second in every other category. So you can't even worry about if you're punting a category, getting any of them. Yeah. And I think it's more common. And I know Michael, like you said, saves punting saves is is pretty common, but I think it is more common to punt a offensive category. And for me, it's because there's just too much fear about the two ratios that you have in a typical five by five between ERA and whip. Those relievers, you know, can and typically do, even though they're not as many innings and it's not as big of a chip, they do chip away, help you chip away at those ratios. And to have those starters, like if you have nine pitcher slots, typically you have two, maybe three relievers in there. You replace them with three starters. They better be three really good starters. Otherwise, you're putting in a four plus ERA guy, 1.25 plus ERA whip guy into your into your rotation all year long like kevin said you're not gonna have you're not gonna go this halfway you're gonna do this all the way through and you're gonna be doing a lot more moving around with maybe non-closer relievers just like chip away at that at those ratios toward the end of the season and there there's a lot more unreliability in 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 those ratios like i talked about with average these ratios can go up or down players other players People in your leagues can come up to you and they can also drop below you as well, as opposed to those counting categories, which are a little bit more, you know, solid. I think I, I agree, Michael, that I'm more apt to do a punting in a head to head league, especially if it's a head to head league. I'm going to jump. I'm going to jump down into the into our notes to segue right into the idea of going the complete opposite way. And that is especially in a head to head league the all bullpen model of your pitching uh, staff. This is something I did in, in a dynasty league um, a couple years ago, and I've seen it done and I've seen it talked about a couple here or there. It's not as popular as I thought it might be. It brought me all the way to the championship that year of my dynasty league. Could not make it work in the final round, but the idea of basically punting wins and strikeouts in an effort to ass- assure the other three categories in your typical five by five, your, your saves, your ERA and your whip, especially if you have elite closers that aren't going to lose their job. Is this a strategy that you've either ever tried out? As you said, you've been doing head to head leagues through Yahoo for a long time now. Is this something that you would be interested in? And if so, is this even the year to do it? in? I have definitely done a healthy amount of bullpen arms at times. Sure. It seems like in head to head, I always hang out to at least one starter. If I had drafted a really good starter, like a Max Scherzer, I just don't want to let them go. And I, I do almost all bullpen for head to head. You keep that one or two starters just because you might have innings requirements in your leagues. In fact, if you do a quality head to head league, you definitely have weekly innings minimum pitched. That's a requirement. That's something I also mention in the FDN five tool drainancy guide where I say, Hey, if you're running a respectable league, there has to be a certain floor, like a bottom so that everybody's keeping the league integrity going. But that's a side note that, you know, it's not important. What is important is if you're using the reliever model, I, I think it's really useful for head to head because you can dominate those ERA and whip categories. And if you have K nine, it's, it's party time. K nine, this it's an easy call. It's almost, no brainer, but if it's counting stats K's, you could you're gonna lose that. You would actually probably punt that most likely based on the rest of the roster construction in your league. So I'm a fan of it. I've done, like I said, almost that seven, eight relievers and two starters. And from there, it's worked quite well. So I'm very much willing to take a chance on a full reliever model it also gets complicated with positional eligibility if you have starting pitcher eligibility but there's relievers who have starter eligibility a couple years ago sean newcomb was an example of that he was a starter moved into relief role and when he was good which was not always the case (laughs) but when he was useful uh, he was somebody that could be really effective for this type of model so make sure the positional layout and the structure of your roster of course if Knowing your league rules is numero uno when you're doing anything related to your fantasy leagues. But I, yeah, I think this is 
a good way to go. I could see it thriving, even if we are uncertain of closer roles and the lockout and all that jazz. What we do know is that these relievers you're targeting can keep your ratios low. Yeah, this is a strategy I would highly recommend, especially not only with the K-9 example that Michael gave, but if you are in a head-to-head win-loss league, not a category Mm -hmm. league, if you just win, if you get one point for winning that week and or one point in the loss column, if you lose that week, this is a much more viable situation because you don't actually care that you only won five to four. You just care that you won. And the more wins you get, the better chance you have of making that playoff push. Kevin, is the reliability or unreliability of closers in the, going into this year, at least as we're viewing it, would that deter you from utilizing this kind of a strategy or would you just take more risk? I hadn't really considered this uh, until you put it in the show notes because at every league I've played in has had an innings minimum. And even with yearly minimums, if you're playing uh, majority or all relievers, you're definitely not getting to the thousand it used to be. Most of my leagues have dropped that minimum to 750. But if you're using all relievers, you're not getting to 750 either. So I hadn't really (laughs) considered this. And when I started thinking about it, I realized if you might want one or two, kind of the way we've been talking in these draft or hold, draft and holds, one or two of, of the guys we want right now. But if it's a fab head-to-head league, I'm not drafting my relievers early either. I'm going to have eight or nine of my top ten rounds are hitters. Because if I'm playing nine relievers, they don't have to be the best relievers. I only need... 15 saves on the season out of each one of them accumulating over average each week to still win that save category. Even those say mediocre, we'll call them relievers are still going to have a better ERA than someone's else. Seven starters. Typically I'm still going to win the ratios and the saves, but where I'm really going to take advantage of it is with my hitters. Sure. And if you are filling up with the Paul Seawolds of the world, you're actually giving yourself your ch- a chance in a head to head league of, you know, sneaking in a couple of K's and at least forcing your opponent's hand to play more of their pitchers. Like in this scenario, you're going to find a situation where you're pl- where the opponent you're playing that week realizes what you're doing. And if <laughs> yeah. they have a good start out of Mike Serger on, in the, on their first day and they hit the, if they have a low minimum for the week they're going to just bench everybody like, all right, cool. I've got what I need. I've got, I got the two ratio categories. That's what they're going for. Maybe I'll throw out, you know, their next best starter later on in the week, but they, they don't have to take the risk. So you are putting your opponent in a situation where they have to think a little bit more, but if they realize what's going on and they get lucky early on, you you do dig yourself a hole and you're going to have to get yourself out of it by the end of the week. All right, let's talk about, we're talking about fab. Let's talk about everybody's favorite thing, Michael. You touched on it earlier in the show, and that is streaming. And it's most most commonly known regarding starting pitching. You're streaming your two star pitchers to get those that get that volume, get those counting stats. But as Scott Chu said on an episode mid season last year, you can stream anything. Like you can stream anything you want as long as it makes sense. I think the examples that we always give are besides starters, you can stream catchers, especially in a one catcher league. It's a little harder to do that in a two catcher league in a 15 teamer, but you can still do it. You can, especially on a, your standard Yahoo format where you only have three outfielders is really easy to stream outfielders who have really good matchups coming up. And I always say you can stream stats as well. Like you can stream stolen base guys, especially in a head to head league. If you're just looking for that one or two stolen bases, they're going to push you over the top. And even and so in a roto league, you can, again, if you're just trying to chip away, we talk about this usually right after the all-star break, you start realizing what categories that you need to focus on. You can stream each of those categories as you need. And you should be doing that, especially in the second half of the season. If you are planning on streaming, by position how does that affect your roster build during a draft like for example if you're going to stream starting pitching or an outfielder are you building a strong top and leaving the final spots empty or are you just waiting to draft that st- that starting pitcher altogether until later in the draft stream stream that seems like an obvious choice for a song i don't know if that's been done yet i'm sure it has 
That's an well, Everly got it Brothers cover. Now. By it the is way. now. It is now <laughs> trademarked. That's yours now. <laughs> it doesn't sound nearly as good without the Everly Brothers harmony. It's just not the same. But uh, that's one thing I do on the Plasma Podcast. I'm a total doofus. I like to have fun. We take the game seriously. I finished third in my main event league last year. So just in case you're looking for credentials, I'm not bragging. I'm just letting you know if you've never heard me before that I do try to win money first and foremost. But we have a lot of laughs. We like to do parody songs. I did a song about Akil Badu. I'm a Tigers fan. I'm from Detroit area. Akil Badu, when he came up last year, that was exciting. And I did a cover a parody of the police. Do Akil Badu. Fathers from Ghana. That type of thing. It's great. If you want to check it out, it's on our plus a podcast youtube channel anyways you didn't ask for any of that although a cube would be a fine addition to your squad in 2022 but that's the kind of guy that i would take over a pitcher and then worry about pitchers later for streaming purposes and i'll actually say this too by the way i still have never met scott chu i really want to meet him he seems like a really fascinating dude just a note but adam to your point about Streaming pitchers is more common. Uh, streaming hitters is becoming huge for me, especially on the off days and head to head where I got to fill gaps. I want to try to sneak a few more at bats and plate appearances in. That is where streaming hitting is becoming much more part of my yearly routine now. So it wasn't always like that, but it is part of my habits now. But for pitchers, I don't need to invest in those elite guys because I'll. Take the best player available. I'll take a chance on a guy that I think has potential and might bust out. Uh, Bobby Witt Jr., we all see the potential. We're waiting for the bust out. I don't know if I want to pay that high a price, but it's just an example of somebody that I would rather take because I'm going to stream pitchers. They're all going to show up later. They always do. Look, Carlos Rodon last year was, come on. I know that doesn't always Robbie happen Ray. every year. <laughs> Robbie Ray. Saw a young winner. These things happen every year the pitchers that get buried and you can't predict them either i'm not saying that there's a prognosticating tool that allows you to predict when that person who was left for dead will return to you and give you fantasy glory i'm not saying that's possible they're out there and there's nothing wrong with taking risks late in your draft filling all the spots with the best players available in your roster but still getting I'm not saying dismiss starting pitching entirely. I'm still going to get some guys in the first 200 picks that I like here and there, but I'm not worried about it as much because I know there's guys that I'll pick up stream who will be mainstays for my rotation rest of season. They won't just be streamers. They'll be permanent. And that happens every year. I can guarantee it. I could look up my old rosters and my head to head leagues. And I know that it's happened every single year. It's just a matter of, was I the guy? Uh, Lucas Giolito a couple of years ago, before he had that first breakout season, that was a guy picked up as a streamer, and he pitched so well that it just kept happening, and then the breakout happened. Yeah, Kevin, you talked about that recently. We're just I'll be the one that's able to stream these guys, and I'll be able to stream the good ones, and I'll hold on to the good ones. So is this a? <laughs> I'm assuming this is Kevin. This is something that you're continuously doing, almost regardless of format. Yeah, absolutely, I agree, hundred percent, because. Everything Michael said is absolutely true. It also means your opponent doesn't even have the opportunity to pick these guys up if they wait to see it happen first. The Great guys point. that are streaming these guys, they're already rostered. Nobody else has a chance at them. Yeah, and when we get to the hitters, Michael, that's a great point. I do this in my head-to-head Yahoo League all the time. It's fill in those Mondays, fill in those Thursdays. Yes. Um, in the early in the season, for whatever reason, fill in those random Fridays that teams have off or whatever. But almost especially in a head-to-head league, like you got to focus on those at-bats because they mean that much more in any given week than they do in a, in a complete season. Yeah, I, I know we talk about maximize at-bats in full season, Agreed, but in a head to head, they just mean that much more in a seven day period rather than, you know, 160 day period. I, I do wonder, we hear about this all the time. At least I hear about this all the time, but especially in outfield is not that deep when you're playing in a Yahoo format. We referenced this all year last year. It's like, there's these guys that are going to be available on your wire in a Yahoo league because you only start three outfielders as opposed <laughs> to an NFBC or fan tracks or what have you. You have four or five outfielders um, in your standard league. And of course, every league can be adjusted. My Dynasty League on Yahoo, we've upped it to four outfielders and added an infielder position. So every league is going to be adjusted to match what you think is more appropriate to the to how your league is playing. So you really got to know that. But 
in those types of leagues, I would be pushing my outfielders down in my draft. Like if I know I'm going to end up streaming that position and you're looking for that guy, that breakout guy, that Brian Reynolds, when he came up and took everybody by storm before he was terrible and before he was good again, these are the types of guys you can stream in and works just like starting pitcher. And then you'll be able to have that guy in your lineup while they're breaking out and not having to you know wait around and feel like I really don't want to drop Justin Upton because he's been so good. He's been a mainstay in my lineup and I he could be good again. I'm not worried about that, especially in a league where I'd have only three outfielders or I have I don't have a position of concern due to the talent pool that we find on the wire throughout the course of the season. Yeah, that's a great point. No doubt about that, Adam. And the other thing I'm realizing here, I'm looking at my team from last year. This is my home league. It's a head-to-head. And I, we also have keepers, so this is different. So just imagine that you're taking studly studs as your draft picks. Mike Trout, Acuna. But I had Garrett Cole mixed in, so if you're looking for a frame of reference of a pitcher, that was one guy I kept as a pitcher. But beyond that, the first time I took a pitcher was six rounds into the draft. So I was going hitter because I liked all those guys. And then I went with Sandy Alcantara who was good, but I also went with Dylan Bundy, who was terrible. So I want to let you know that, yes, it works I am ways. not, <laughs> yeah, I, I make mistakes all the time. So that was regrettable. And you got to be honest about it. I think any quality analyst worth their weight in whatever is very valuable these days, Bitcoin, whatever it is, will always tell you when they get it wrong too. Yeah, absolutely. We like to <laughs> talk about some of the picks we make during the fab season and, and, maybe overbid on or underbid on. Though that's not typically Kevin because Kevin's slogan is they'll probably go for more than I'm willing to pay for it anyway. So I'm not sure yeah. Kevin actually ever picks up any. That brand. actually fits in here perfectly with what we're talking about. The streamers aren't always going to work out. I, there there was a week last year about mid season. I, I was very confident in John Lester that week and he got blown up not just once, but twice. It doesn't always work. But Austin Gombert, I, I, I think. Yeah. I was just going to say it. That's exactly the name I was just going to say, Adam. But then he good was job. good. Then he, he was, was good, good for so long after that. And he sat was. in everybody's waiver yes. wire because nobody would touch him <laughs> when he was great for the rest of the year. Yeah, so it doesn't always work. I feel like it, with my experience, uh, it works out more times than not. And the end of last season when DVR was here, I – even if it doesn't work out, I'm, I'm still getting strikeouts and hopefully my, the rest of my foundation has the ratios that are th- able to withstand it. Yeah. And it's ultimately, especially when you're in a Roto League too, all you really care about is that end result, like the individual pickup on a, especially on a starting uh, pitcher stream plan that you might put out for yourself throughout the course of the year, as long as the end result is positive, net positive, those individual ones you don't have to, don't worry about those so much. Nick Pollock does it when he talks about when he does his streaming pick of the day. He does a stream pick every single day, no matter what, even if the options are terrible. And he just tracks that throughout the course of the season. You realize, yeah, some of those picks are going to be bad. But at the end of the day, you added X amount of strikeouts. You added a, probably a decent ERA because you got some really good gems in there. Michael Simeon does this all the time as well when he talks about his streamers. Like it all adds up. It's not the individual pickup that you're making. It's the end result. All right, well then let's let's move away from streaming and let's talk about more of a draft strategy. And then we we touched on this at the end of our last episode. And so I want to go a little bit more detail and get your takes on this. And that's the idea of handcuffing. We hear about this more so, I think, in fantasy football with running backs and what have you. And that's the most fantasy football talk that you will hear on this podcast. But the idea of handcuffing either stats or positions and positions specifically we talked about on the last episode about especially in a draft and hold with your relievers or your catchers and so if this standard league is does it matter whether or not it is a draft and hold first and foremost kevin you're going to be thinking about this idea of handcuffing your your possible your catcher and these draft and hold these 50 rounders it's pretty typical for everybody to draft four catchers. Just so you have those backups on your bench. And mm-hmm. I tried to do this in this current DC that we're in right now, but I got I missed out on I have Omar Navarez, Milwaukee, missed out on Pedro Severino as the backup there. I think that would be really good. So Omar goes down. Pedro can step right into my lineup. And worst case, also, if I realize Narvarez is gonna miss out on some weekend at bats. 
I can throw in Pedro as well and get, get those guaranteed at bats. Does it matter? Is this is catcher? Probably not. But like it, it, are, the idea of handcuffing positions in both a draft and hold in a fab league, is it something that you focus on or suggest? I don't focus on it in a fab league. In fact, if it happens, it's probably by accident or it, it's by way of fab in season because things don't appear to be going well for the the guy I drafted, but absolutely in a draft and hold. And I, I 100% understand Tanner Bell's point that he made on the last episode about it takes away your ceiling. Both guys can't hit. I understand that 100%. But if it's late enough in the 50 rounds, I don't care. It's an insurance policy. Uh, that's exactly what the, the, the term handcuffing came from was this is an insurance policy. And I did it with catcher in this league. I, I drafted Jose Trevino after I took Jonah Heim earlier in the draft. I've done it with closers. Josh Stalmont much later than a league I took Scott Barlow. I think that's the example we brought up on the last episode. In this current draft we're in, I took Emilio Pagan because I had taken, oh goodness, what's his name, Adam? <laughs> oh, Pierce Johnson. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I saw that. I saw that because I yeah, wanted, exactly. I, I had Pagan start in my queue, so I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, so I took Pagan later. Now, this situation, it, it with closers, it's actually better because you can get value out of both of them. If San Diego is going closer by committee or even has a seven-game week, I can play both of those guys in my lineup if everything's going right with them at the time. So it, it, it is definitely more popular with relievers, I believe, and, and something that I do like to do in draft and holds. And yes, when you're looking in for the third and fourth catcher in the late forties rounds of a draft and hold, <laughs> There's not a starting catcher out there. There's not a catcher you think is going to get even 300 quality plate appearances. Why not just handcuff a starter you already have if you're fairly certain he would be the answer if something were to happen and, and your starting catcher would go down? Yeah, I'm a fan of it as well. I don't think it hurt. I don't really think it hurts your overall. Even I, I get. It. I think Jeff was the one that mentioned like, you can only get so many saves. Like you want as many saves as possible. If you're handcuffing the your bullpen, you're limiting your ceiling there. But there's so much volatility in bullpens, especially nowadays. Never mind the last you just the last couple of years that I'm not personally worrying about, especially in these draft and holds. My w the other half of handcuffing is not just put by position. But it's by stats. And that is, I always come, I always think of a term that I don't know if he came up with it or not, but like Justin Mason used to always say, like the Gallo pillow. Picking, if you're going to draft Joey Gallo, you better have a pillow for him, his terrible batting average to land on. And so if you're able to pair him with somebody who, like, Maybe a Nicky Lopez, if he keeps at that 300 average and gets those double digit steals, maybe 20 steals, maybe that is a good pairing. Is that something that you are thinking about in your drafts? If you're willing to take a guy who's going to be detrimental in a certain category or give you nothing and looking for his mirror image later on in the draft? Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. You want to fill the void if you can. Handcuffing for me also has to do with rookies, prospects in a sense too. Sometimes you will, or I will, I'll have a guy ready to go who I think will slide into that role and replace the player. Now, that might also mean the player is not very worthy, so it not, might not be a handcuff. It's more of just, I'm expecting this person to take over that role, and you wait on it. You wait. It happens every year. You're waiting on Chris Bryant years ago, and then you're waiting on Acuna, and you're waiting on Whit Jr., like I said now. As catchers, you know, Adley Rushman, I know I put him on at least two drafted holds last year. I drafted him. Like, oh, yeah, he'll probably be up by September. The Orioles are awful. They have nothing to play for except draft picks. But that didn't happen either. So sometimes it doesn't go your way. But I would agree with all the sentiments you guys have expressed here. This is how it works for fantasy baseball for the most part. You just pick up guys that you're trying to prevent a total collapse or a free-for-all from happening with another player. And in draft and holds, that's where it happens for sure. And I think now catcher gets so bogus in these draft and holds for me that I think I'm going to 
make it a priority to have a minimum of at least six catchers on my roster going forward. I really think even if you try to do the backup, like you said, the handcuff of the guy. Oh, okay. The Tigers had like five, <laughs> five catchers last year. It was, it was real hodgepodge. There was Jake Rogers was a future. Then he was no good. And then there's just other guys that slid in and they took advantage of the opportunity at the end of the year. I think the Marlins had four catchers on their roster. There was a mess over there. So it's a smart move for those types of positions, especially the ones where you feel there's less confidence in. Yeah. When I'm handcuffing, when I am drafting and handcuffing my like stats, like I'm focusing on guys that are going to give me extremes in certain categories though. Like I'm not necessarily worried about getting a 25 home run guy who gives me no steals and handcuffing him with somebody who gives me steals. Like I will focus on the Joey Gallows. I will focus on those guys who are going to give me possibly give me 40 some odd home runs or the mile straws of the world that in theory could repeat and give me another 30 stolen bases with absolutely no pop. And so I would rather mimic those, put those guys together like a mile straw plus a Joey Gallo. And I know there's a lot of mile straw talk going on Twitter right now, but those are like, I would rather put those extremes together than just then worry about those mid tier guys. And I rather than, going after the more balanced approach, which, you know, is more common that you hear about. Oh, you'd rather get, I'd rather, would you rather have a guy who's going to go 25, 10, or would you rather have two guys, one guy that's going to go 40, zero, and another guy that's going to go 35 and the other way around. So I'm, if I'm going to go with the handcuffing with statistics, I'm going to typically go um, in a more extreme, in a ex- more extreme route. Yeah, one of the Tigers catchers, Eric Haas, was that guy. He became extreme for a while with power, so that can happen. Yeah, the, and Joey Gallo is the perfect example for something like this. Like, you you act, asked us that to have a pairing of a couple of players ready. The, the pairing I have brought up for years was Joey Gallo and Whit Merrifield. If you merge their steamer projections right now you get two (laughs) players that are each going to hit over 245 with 27 home runs 80 runs 80 rbis 90 runs scored and 15 stolen bases you get two of those players now they're a long they're a long ways apart in the draft so you really gotta jump joey gallo a couple of rounds to make sure you get him if that's your plan but you brought up in your example because the other one I had written down was Joey Gallo and Nicky Lopez. They're going right next to each other in ADP. They're both right around pick 200 or over the past couple of weeks. So if you're on a turn and you can, so you know that you can grab them both and, and it, it's not a lot worse than you're looking at the 240, 22 home runs. 73 76 and and nine stolen bases a piece from two players you're getting in the 13th round 13 14 turn you're not finding two of those guys at that point but you just did (laughs) i i I did this on the opposite end of the spectrum i did this on the pitching side during my pitcher list mock draft talked about it with nick pollock and I did, I had a close to the turn. I think it was third. So it was close to the turn. So I was able to pair those picks together. And the one that I put together was, I think it was Tyler Molly and Jose Hurkiti. And it's a guy who's going to give me the strikeouts, but I, a lot of volatility there in the ratios with Urquidy, who has maybe some strikeout upside, but has a history as long as he can you know, stay healthy, balancing out my ratios. So putting those two guys together, and they're, and they're relatively close in ADP. So you do, have, to your point, Kevin, that's a scenario where you do have to go with a turn or get lucky and get them back to, in back-to-back picks. But knowing who you're drafting and what detriment they're going to bring to your team in addressing that quickly goes a long way. Yeah. There's a guy like Justin Turner and Alberto Montesi again, pairing them because you can't trust Montesi and Turner's available later. And he's always so surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, but just so consistent these days. So that is, I think I do more of it in the positional players than I even do it with the relievers, which is most common now that I think about it. All right, and we'll go, let's hit on the last uh, topic that I put here on the outline. And of course, Kevin, I'm going to start with you. You know what? No, I'm going to start with you because you're talking about how much you wanted to get into that noisy auction that you peaked on in at first pitch. So I'm going to get your take on the 
stars and scrubs mentality of auctioning in, in your players in that format where you have a budget and you can get as Jeff Zimmerman was talking about in the last episode, you can get four or five guys that would typically go in like the sixth or seventh round, where obviously you can only get one or two of those guys in a draft. What is your take on the idea of going stars and scrubs, going after spending the majority of your budget on high-end players, first the fourth round type players that would go in a, in a typical draft, and then going dollar days for the remainder and hoping you hit big. So basically getting a whole bunch of first, second, and third round picks and then not having another pick until, say, round 30 or 40. Yeah, that's probably not me. I think I'm the type of guy who likes to keep the money and wait it out, and be patient, nominate really cheap guys that I would be happy with if I got them for a dollar or two, and then maybe strike on the middle to elite. But I don't think maybe outside of one guy I spent a hefty salary on last year when I did my auction. And I, otherwise, I like to get the middle, like the the centerpiece right down. If you have a steak, it's medium rare, that pink center right there. The, that's what I want. I want those players in there. Although a really good steak, you could think of as like an elite player. Oh, man, that's a really good steak. I want to be like that because it's so good. I want to be as good as that steak, and that's an elite player. I digress here, clearly. My bottom line is I don't want to spend too much in one place. Uh, I think football is different, but we're not talking about football. We're talking about baseball. And to me, there's so many more options of players that could be had for less that you can be patient with your money. And I'll take the scrubs all day. Give me the scrubs, as they call them. They're they're really easy to acquire, and they don't cost you much. Cedric Mullins was an absolute steal last year. I know he won't come up every year. There's not always a Cedric Mullins. I understand that. But there's usually somebody like that, whether it's a pitcher or a hitter, where you can save your money and then put it towards that middle, the, you know, the rest of the world here. There's the elites, right? There's the 99%, the 1%. Well, I want the middle, whatever the 50% is. I want to get in there in the sandwich zone, if you will. If there's two pieces of bread, I want what's in the sandwich in between, and I don't need the bread. Although bread could be not as exciting, so those wouldn't be elite players. I don't know. These analogies are just terrible, but I know what I'm trying to say. I think I know what I'm trying to say. I think it depends on the type of bread that you're making your sandwich out of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's very true. So much wonderful bread out there. Oh, man. Kevin, if I'm not mistaken, you're not a, typically a fan of this strategy. I think we talked about this a year ago or so, but correct me if I'm wrong, but if you or had to go, if you were going to go this route, where would you spend most of your attention? Would you be more pitching side or more on the hitting side for your stars? Definitely the hitting side. The reason I love auctions is because I, like Jeff Zimmerman mentioned last episode, you brought it up was he wants six of those mid range pitchers. You'd rather, you can't get six of them in a snake draft. You can in an auction. The other thing that Zach Waxman brought up a couple of weeks ago and and when i thought about it i've done this but i didn't realize i was doing it typically in an auction you have to fill your 23 starting positions with the auction you can't do like you can in a snake draft and start drafting reserve players and then fill in your some starting positions with your 30th 35th pick you have to fill your starting positions in if you're in a 12 team league and every player drafts two relievers, we're only drafting 84 starters in the first 24 rounds. There's still top 100 pitchers left in the reserve rounds. So there's still really good pitching left when the auction's over. So it's something that I definitely am going to go hitting side with that. And I like to spread it around even with those stars. I don't like the $50 guy. And then my and and then a twenty dollar guy. I'd rather have two thirty dollar hitters. Sometimes the types of guys that over the past couple of years I've noticed that are in that range that really drop off in auction dollar amount compared to the top guys are the guys that don't steal bases. Freddie Freeman, Rodon, not. Uh, Rendon, not a great example because he got hurt for most of last year, but so much less auction money necessary to get those types of guys than the guys that steal bases too. So you can get 
two end of first beginning of second round guys for the same price as you can typically get Fernando Tatis or Boba Shett. Yeah, I have found I haven't done a ton of auctions myself in the last couple of years. I have found myself trying to get more balanced, but I, I found myself jumping into the trap. Of it's end, so hard ending up doing stars and scrubs. <laughs> It's yes, so hard. I, I, I want him. He's so yeah. good. I want him. I still um, have two hundred and sixty dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I not bidding? I on have Mike to Trout? spend it all, right? It's, I can't yeah. take it with me. <laughs> yeah, right. I, I'm new to it too, by the way, Adam. But like auctions were a newer thing for me last year, so I would defer to the veteran Kevin. All hail Kevin Hastings. But I will. I will stick with my aunt new league for sure. I don't plan on jumping in a lot more of auction leagues because I also feel like if I'm not able to do the auction live, not what's the point. But that's the, half the fun, as you talked about, Michael. As you looked in, like that looked like such a fun room. And the auctions that I <laughs> have been in that have been live have been a ton of fun, even with a, not as good of an auctioneer as uh, Jeff Erickson. And there's still a ton of fun. And, and I've done an online, I just did a slow uh, mock auction that was put on. It was an odd new uh, mock auction. And it was fun, but it was weird because it was slow. And it was just like, all right, I check it twice a day. Okay. I'll bid on this guy. And I know it was for research and to figure it out. But if I'm in an auction, I want to, I want to be in it. Kevin, to your point, I think you mentioned it though. The only caveat is that the auctions can go a whole lot longer oh, <laughs> than absolutely. your typical you're, draft. You're several hours. Yes. You got uh, to dig in. You got to dig in. Especially if you're talking a home league and there's drinking involved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's and for the don't... diehards. I love it. <laughs> All right. I think that's, uh, Michael, is there any other general draft strategy that you, whether you want to quote from your FTN a blurb on head to head or just your general thoughts on wh- what kind of mentality you go into drafts, uh, thinking about regardless of the climate that you're going into e- year to year that y- you think is worth sharing? The only thing I want to say is what you've probably heard before and it's not new, but it's just very important to not be succumbed by ADP. Don't do it. You have people you like. Remove ADP from your equation. Go with the people that you want, and you've done the work. And if you trust in yourself, do what you want to do. This is the biggest lesson I learned from 2021. Not my first year. I played fantasy baseball for 20 years, and I've been around. But still, there's stuff to be learned. And I learned that I have to trust me. It's great to be on shows like this and listen to other people like Adam and Kevin, who know what they're talking about, and I absorb their information. But last year, we went on a bender of guests to start the year on the Palazzo podcast, and it was ridiculous. I think we had about 35 guests in two months. It was just nonstop. I just was like, oh, here we go. We're going for it. I want everybody. I want to get as many pieces of information from as many perspectives as possible. And I don't think it was very healthy in the long run. Because I diverted because of that guy said that's, yeah, he really likes Nick Senzel this year. That's a good call. That's not a good call. <laughs> and you know, <laughs> the worst thing you can do is to end up with a player like that who just completely wastes your time because you respect someone else. You can respect them, but you can also not listen to what they have to say when it comes to your own squads. Do you in this situation be selfish and don't worry about ADP? Take the guys that you want. I took Shohei Otani. And uh, was the TGFBI 80 picks ahead of ADP because I was excited about him for the 2021 season. And that's fine. And it worked out great. That's an extreme example of, oh, woohoo, it all worked out so wonderful. But this is what you can live with. And remember that. I know it's not do or die. It's just fantasy baseball. But at the end of the season, you want to say, you know what? I took my best shot with the guys I thought would work out and either it worked or it didn't. I think you'll feel a lot better about yourself knowing that you stuck to your own process. Absorb. I'm recovering from opioid. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> filter. I'm recovering from opioid misuse for years, and I'm happy about that. What I remember most about going to meetings and stuff is they say, take what you want and leave the rest. So when it comes to drafting, just take what you need, leave the rest, and you do you, people. Do you. I love it. Great advice, Michael. Thank you. Kevin, any last second advice that you want to ch- ch- chime in on there or <laughs> I think Michael <laughs> no, I agree with Michael 100% one quick thing we uh, with all of these strategies make sure the rules of your leagues we we say it all the time some 
innings limits, both minimums and maximums at bad limits, minimums and maximums affect these things. I'm not mm-hmm. going to have a handcuff at catcher in an NFBC style league where I only have seven bench spots. It's not going to happen. So make sure you know the format before you implement any of these strategies. Yeah, that's huge as well. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to break this all down with us. Can you take one last second to remind our listeners where they can follow, listen, read your work, any anything you got working moving forward that they should be keeping an eye out for? All hail Nick Pollock. Thank you so much. We got PitchCon coming up this month. That's exciting. I've never been involved in it, but I think I'm I might be involved this year. I don't know that for sure yet, but I would love to participate. It's a good cause too. So that'll be fun. And I'm sure you guys will be talking more about that. I am at Palazzo Podcast, two L's, two Z's. That's where our podcast does what we do. Our first episode of the year will be available to you when you hear this with Austin Byler, who's a really fascinating dude with a great story to tell. He was a former minor leaguer and now he's a mental health advocate and a motivational, inspirational speaker, if you will. So um, that's going to be cool. Palazzo Podcast. Of course, you can follow me personally at MJ Govier, G-O-V is in Victor I-E-R on Twitter. That's basically where I do all my work. Twitter's home base. Believe it or not, you can actually make Twitter a useful, positive space for yourself. It can be done. No. I am doing it. I'm telling you, Adam, <laughs> it can be done. Don't believe the hype. That's where I answer questions. So if you have fantasy questions, just DM me anytime, or you can email the show, whatever it's best for you. That's what we want. I'm really glad that you guys brought me on the show. I love Kevin. And now I'm getting to know you, Adam. So now we all know each other. And I got to say, this is the kind of stuff that makes doing what we do worthwhile. I want to thank you guys very much for having me on. Michael, thank you so much for coming, man. This was a blast. And I hope I hope everybody listening could hear how fun <laughs> this whole conversation was. And hopefully everybody you, you take something up, take something from it. So make sure to check out Plazo Pod. Join the Plazo Pod Listener League. Join our on the wire listener league as well. You know, you can DM us at on the wire pod on Twitter as well. Whenever you like, and specifically to, you know, join that league with me, Kevin and I. Hopefully, Michael, as well, we'll, as you figure out what your draft plans are for the remainder of the uh, 2022 (laughs) draft season. We have two more episodes scheduled to come out this month of January. Then we'll be hitting you up weekly starting in February. So keep a lookout for those incoming. There are amazing podcasts that come out every single day on the Pitcher List Pod's main feed. So please make sure to subscribe to the podcast and the Pitcher List Fantasy Baseball feed wherever you listen. Leaving, of course, a rating and a good review is always appreciated on whatever format you're listening. You can follow myself on the Twitter for all the good vibes, like Michael said, at 80 grade. That's all spelled out. And of course, Kevin is at Hasting Kevin. And also make sure to follow at Pitcher List Pods to get updates on every new episode of every Pitcher List Podcast Network show and give them all a listen. Thanks once again to Michael Govier for joining us. And on behalf of Kevin Hastings, I am Adam Howe. With that, we bid you goodbye.